Muslim communities at, at Cape Breton University. Uh, welcome to today's workshop. It's the first in a short course on digital filmmaking practice being delivered by Dr. Michael McDonald. He's going to give another wave just so you remember that it's him and not me there in that beautiful golden screen. Um, Michael McDonald is a professor at McEwen University. He's an award-winning award filmmaker and an ethnomusicologist. And as we begin, I would like to gratefully acknowledge that we are broadcasting from the Center for Sound Communities, which is located in Unamagi, in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of our neighbors, the Mi'kmaq people and the Wolostokwia from Maliseet some of whom may be joining us today as co-researchers and students at CBU. Uh, before we begin today, and just at the start of today's workshop, I'd like to also acknowledge the partnership of the International Council for Traditional Music and the Canadian Society for Traditional Music, two organizations that are co-sponsors and partners that are making this happen, this short course, which is part of the Centre for Sound Communities first pilot summer institute and you can learn more about that at soundcommunities.org our website or on our facebook feed um, i'd also like to acknowledge uh many of you will see nasim in the screen nasim want to give it just a wave nasim ahmadian is a graduate student at the university of alberta and she is a coordinator for this particular component of a larger project called Dialogues, which works to decolonize sound, music, and dance studies through action, workshops, various initiatives like this one that's being led by Dr. Michael McDonald. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Daniel Akira Sadniki, who is the project manager for Dialogues. And you may be hearing from him at different points in email. He provides support for these all of these different components. Um, so uh, again, I'd like to thank Dr. Michael McDonald uh, for delivering this course to all of us free as part of his uh, practice, decolonizing practice in our field. And, uh, and at this point to also welcome him to just outline what we'll be doing through this month together in the course and in today's workshop so that you have some idea as we begin the afternoon. So Michael, welcome and thank you again. Thanks Marcia and uh, thank you everybody. Um, I'm, I'm speaking to you from uh, I'm in the, uh, the Edmonton, Alberta, um, what settlers call Edmonton. Um, as Marcia said, I work at uh, McEwen University um, and um, I'm really pleased to be giving this workshop today uh, and over the next month. The, roughly, the way we're going to be running things is today we're going to be talking about production. Um, in the next section, we're going to be talking about um, editing, and then we're going to be talking about mastering and, uh, and mixing and putting out, a, putting out a film project. For the, those of you that are going to be following along and uh, making a film, in, in the process, we're going to have a uh, kind of a, a sharing kind of peer review screening opportunity when people get to share their films and then we get to um, we get to provide feedback and engage with one another and and uh, and work through in practical ways the the things that we, we have been talking about over the last couple of uh, the previous couple of workshops. And then um, we're going to get together and watch the final films, which would be super fun. Um, for those of you who have never made a film before, um, fantastic, welcome. Let's, uh, I look forward to playing. For those of you who have made a film before, um, we are all going to learn something, uh, including me, and I look forward to your, your engagement and, and, and feedback and thoughts. Um, I sent out um, a link to a reading that we're going to start with, and uh, maybe you can, you can dig that out. And we're, we're going to be starting with a reading because there's, I've been making films for about 15 years and a little over 15 years. And in the process, um, I've struggled with some 
some basic things, some struggle. I, I guess I can say I've struggled to overcome some things. And the reading that I've assigned today will help um, will help you cut a lot of a lot of problems out of out of your thinking about about making about making film. There's a couple of different starting points that uh, we'd like to engage with. One of them is the emergence of what in Canada is called research creation. And in, uh, in chat, I'm just gonna write this um, just so you can see it. Um, research creation uh, has a hyphen, research hyphen creation. And it has, in, it's developing in Canada in, in, in kind of three different kind of definitional pockets that I just wanna, I wanna think about because they're, they're, it's directly, um, it's, it directly pertains to precisely the, the work I'm trying to decolonize um, ethnomusicology. First is the research part. And I think we probably don't have to talk much about that. Uh, for those of you who are coming from a, um, an ethnomusicological background, we know what ethnomusicology is. For those of you who are not, uh, I like to, you know, the, uh, the sidewalk conversation, what is an ethnomusicologist? I tend to say uh, it's, uh, it's when anthropologists and uh, musicologists got together and, and had, uh, had conceptual offspring. The, the creation part is where things get a little sticky. If we, if you start with the, the, the book by uh, Stephans and Lacoste, Research Creation as Interdiscipline, they focus on the separation between musical performance in the conservatory and um, musicological research. And, they, and they, they're concerned about the, the gap between, between those two things. Uh, at the University of Alberta, where I did my graduate work, it was that the gap was pretty, pretty extreme where the uh, performance faculty was in one building and the musicology faculty was in another building. Bringing, um, for them, research creation is a way of bringing um, the performance side and the musicology side to together to to help the performance side um, articulate, theorize, engage with um, thinking about their creative work as thinking, and the, the musicology side to work more closely with musicians to think about to think about art more more deeply. In Edmonton at the University of Alberta, um, Professor Natalie Lovelace has written some wonderful books on research creation that takes a slightly different perspective, not coming um, from um, musicology or ethnomusicology, coming from uh, art history, I believe. And in Lovelace's perspective, um, research creation is a way of thinking um, thinking from within the uh, art, um, you know, the fine arts practice and thinking about the contributions that, um, that creation can, the way creation can engage with thinking and can work towards um, political forms of engagement that are, uh, that, can, that can help to decolonize, that can help to um, engage with, with kind of a, a critical pedagogy of, of our practice, but also critical pedagogy of thinking. Um, making art at the end of the world, uh, in Making Art at the End of the World, one of her texts, she talks about in one chapter, polydisciplinary. And what she does is she takes critical polyamory literature coming from an anarchist tradition, and then kind of fuses that with uh, thinking about interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity. So um, Lovelace is looking at a really kind of um, productive, kind of productive and engaged space. The, um, it was an edited collection that she was the editor for called Knowing Knots, which kind of directly engages with Donna Haraway's thinking around, um, around um, nodding and, and knowing and making, making connections with things. So those people, um, those people who were 
uh, who are engaged in hair waste thinking would probably really like really engage with uh, with with that kind of that kind of work. And I find it philosophically very rich and it's very exciting and it's kind of pragmatic in a lot of really interesting ways. The third one, um, and these are not chronological at all, it's just just kind of different instances. The third one I'm going to I'm introducing last because I'm going to focus on it more more closely because I resonate more closely with it. And it has a lot, it has a lot to say to the the other two. And in fact, it kind of crosses over and it's really interesting. The third one comes from a Canadian philosopher by the name of Aaron Manning, who works a lot with um, uh, Whitehead, um, Deleuze, Guattari. Uh, who are the authors of the, the, the article that we're going to be looking at today. For Manning, the hyphen between research creation is what's important, and that's also important to me. And in fact, um, before I came across Manning's work, I had written something where um, I, I had said something about uh, being in, in the hyphen. And I was it was astonished when I also read that in Manning's work that the interest in being in the hyphen. What what is the hyphen? The hyphen is the process between research creation, the research and creation, the way they're um, they're 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 kind of moving in and through each other. It, it recognizes that art is always a form of thinking, and that research is always engaged in forms of composition. And then and what is that play between one one and the other? And it's that play that we're most interested in. Um, and I'm interested in it because one of the things that, um, that has caught my attention in the, the history of ethno, uh, ethnomusicological writing about cinema and, and when I say that, I'm thinking about Feld's article from the 70s that kind of covers um, all of the developments of, of ethnomusicological film up until that, that moment. I'm thinking about um, Titan's article about authority and representation in, uh, in ethnomusicological film. I'm thinking about Hugo Zemp's um, work, particularly, um, the, I, I don't remember the title of the work, this moment, I think it's something like making films about music or something. And he's, you know, talking about, you know, the different kinds of different kinds of technical things that you do with with cameras. I'm thinking about John Bailey's um, work where he's thinking about um, what small format um, film cameras can do. I'm also thinking about his beautiful film, Amir, which is one of the first ethnomusicological films that I had seen that really moved me. I, I, and I, I would say probably um, that, was the, that was a decisive moment for me to recognize that, um, that the ethnomusicological film can be a film in its own right, which is something that's become, in, you know, I, I, perhaps an obsession, um, which if you ask my sister is not such a big thing because apparently I get obsessed with lots of things. Uh, but Amir is, is, is for me, a, a massive jumping off point because there are moments in Amir where it is incredibly personal and the, that, that personal, um, there, there's something that happens for me as a viewer when I, when I watch that film, more so than, than perhaps the later uh, work that Bailey was trying with the, the experiments in small format film. But I'm also thinking more recently about Benjamin Harbert's um, 2018 book, American Music Documentary, Five Case Studies in Cineath Musicology, where um, Ben, who is a, a filmmaker in his own right, sits down with directors who, would, who have made films about music and engages um, with a film director, a Nathan musicologist engaging with a film director, and then the conversations that they have and the way that that produces uh, ways of thinking about the films that, that they made, the documentary films about music that they made from the perspective of an ethnomusicologist, intent and in trying to figure out what an ethnomusicological film is now, what Harvard calls cine ethnomusicology. Which is, which is a term 
that I'll, I'll, you know, adopt from him, cineethnomusicology, and, and by extension, that would, I guess, make me a cineethnomusicologist, if we were, uh, it, you know, it's, which is, you know, I write in my bio sometimes. Um, I don't like saying, you know, Marcy introduced me as a filmmaker and an ethnomusicologist, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to hyphenate those things. I'm trying to figure out a way that, uh, that, um, that I, you know, we can, we can make cine ethnomusicology where um, making cinema becomes a form of thinking. And that's ultimately what I'm interested in. How does cinema become more than um, a, a process of taking field notes? How does it become something that is able to um, engage in different kinds of, different kinds of knowing? And that's able to mobilize, or to use Shirk's language, to engage in knowledge mobilization in ways that um, communities in, can, can um, not just see other people being represented, because you know, as, as we'll see later with the reading, representation is kind of, you know, the, the, the thing that Titan was talking about, representation and authority. Well, that's, that's while that's important, new forms of knowledge I think are more important. And these new forms of knowledge, as we begin to think about decolonizing ethnomusicology, we need to get beyond representation. And we need to begin to think about how other forms of, how cinema can help um, to, to develop, make and share new forms of knowledge. So what uh, I would like to do in this in this lecture in this in this workshop is to find a way to begin to think before we begin to think about the technology of cinema i want to think about um what what um what cinema can can do for us how it can can introduce new forms of thinking and in order to do that, we need to get beyond the idea that when we pick up a, a, a camera, whether that's our phone or, or it's a, or it's a um, you know, expensive you know, digital cinema camera, that we're not just um, collecting images from, from, from around us that are then, um, that are then, then shared. When we engage in cinema, we're engaging in a form of composition. And it's that form of composition that we, we need to start with. So while today is called production, um, I would like to think of it in terms of composition. It's a, it's a form of, um, it's a, a digital cinema as a form of composition. To do that, we need to think about, you know, just like when you sit down in a, in a class to think about writing as a form of composition, you have to think about the mechanics of, of, of writing. We need to think about the mechanics of, of cinema and what that does. And I think one of the most powerful readings to get that started is the reading that, uh, that I assigned. It's, uh, it's called Percept Affect Concept from, from uh, Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari from a book called What is Philosophy? So that's where, that's where I want to get started. But before we do that, can everybody turn on their cameras? Or for those people who are comfortable, turn on your cameras? Because it's like, looking at myself on the screen is freaky. I'm all by myself. I'm talking to myself. Yeah, for those of you who have the digital capacity to uh, to hear and uh, and you don't have to have your mics on, just have your cameras on. Because otherwise I'm talking to an abyss and it's just terrible. Okay. We got gallery view. Yeah, I have gallery view. Hi everybody. Oh, this is way better. So I should say also that um, I've never done this workshop virtually. Um, the, this, this workshop has always been done um, in person where we get to uh, use our phones and, uh, and play with one another. And I think play is an incredibly important part 
of uh, of this process. It's the it's the it, it's what happens in the quote unquote field when I'm I'm making the films that I'm making in. I don't like to think about it making films in the field with all of those special words that we use in ethnomusicology. Um, uh, I make you know, uh, the films that I make are made with friends and we, you know, to, to, uh, to riff on the, the punk idea of doing it yourself, which, you know, punks always realize they never do themselves. I like to think about it, doing it with your friends. So instead of DIY, um, I do DIWYF, do it with your friends. And I think that's uh, I think that's a kind of ethics of of community making that is central to my practice, and I think needs to needs to be central to to uh, ethnomusicological practice as we move forward. Oh yeah, and for those people who can't turn on the camera, totally get it. Not judging you, completely understand. Uh, but thank you for the note. Okay, and for those people who don't want to because you're just happy to be by yourself and not be looking at me, I'm totally down with that too. You do, you do whatever you wanna to do to make yourself feel comfortable. Um, and all right, okay, so um, perhaps just a show of hands, who has made a film of any variety? Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, who uh, who has a uh, who has a smartphone? Does any phone capable of uh, any phone with a camera? Anybody have a phone with a camera? Yeah. Have you ever recorded anything with it? Yeah. Well, no, not anything serious. Just like just. Just do it. Just hit record. You just whether it's Instagram or like sending a video, taking a video of your pet. Which I have a dog, and you're probably going to see my dog because um, in about uh, 45 minutes he's going to be like, "What's going on?" And he's going to try to he's going to get up in my face for attention. So um, you're going to see my dog later. So that's a promise. Uh, okay, so let's. What we're going to do today is we're going to um, we're going to start with the reading. I've kind of introduced research creation and its relation to cinematic musicology a little bit. And I've introduced a little bit uh, what what's at you know the significance of decolonizing ethnomusicology in this way. But let me let me I uh, kind of highlight a couple of things that I think are are open concerns currently when we're beginning to think about ethnomusicology. We've already talked about the question of representation and authority, um, which is really important. Um, the pro the, and, and, and here's here's the rub okay here's here's what I think is is a potential issue with representation while at the same time it's important uh, ethnomusicology has tended towards the um, uh, a form of um, documenting particular cultures as if they're fixed things breaking the discipline into into area studies identified in particular places around the globe. And, and those, those, um, those cultures are, are kind of identified, information is collected and put down you know, on a map. And this is the way it's, this is the way it's set up. Um, for those of us sensitive uh, of the history of colonization, there is a certain kind of colonial administration that is, that is um, entwined with that kind of thinking. And it, and, and there's a to a certain extent, um, there is a um, also a it's kind of like a binary between the ethnos, which is the you know the you know the, all of the others, and and while we're called ethnomusicology, I read in all sorts of all sorts of. Um, feisty conversations on Facebook groups. Well, why, why don't we just get rid of ethno and just be musicologists? And there are people who are defending ethno and people who are critiquing it. And there are some people who are saying ethno really doesn't mean anything terrible. And those people that believe it does. Very valuable conversation. But 
I did, when I did some digging into ethnos, the, the idea of the ethnos, there is kind of a logic behind it that I want to illustrate. The ethnos holds its place in relation to what's what, to relation to the Greek term demos. The Greeks who invented the concept of ethnos um, had the, uh, the, let's say the um, transparent position from which to write the term ethnos. And that transparent position was, was demarcated the demos, that's the citizen. Anybody that's paying any attention to the uh, the crisis in in liberal democracies around the world and the whether or not you know whether or not you're involved in in decolonizing practices um, at all, we know that the, the 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 idea of the demos, if it ever existed, the self you know the unified nation state where all members of the uh, all the members of the nation state are you know you have a, a shared point of view, if that ever existed, it no longer does. That the demos, if it is a thing, has is in the process of being fractured and dissolved. And we can see that in we can see that all, all over the world. I mean, people are writing about this on, on a daily basis. My, you know, to Twitter is 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 crammed. Instagram is crammed by by the the kind of fraught position of liberal democracies, and where where you know members of of states are. Are struggling with with all kinds of all kinds of different um, pressures. The the dissolution of the the idea of the the, the demos is happening. I think um, at a time where in ethnomusicology we're critiquing the the idea of the ethnos, the unified other. Both of these terms are dissolving, and I think I think the dissolution of those terms is posing something fascinating and, and, um, and important for ethnomusicology. Whether or not we, we hold on to the term ethnos, it, it, that's, that's second to me. What's important to me is our perspective. And then this gets played out in very important ways. Let me give you an instance. I made a film uh, called We're Too Loud on the, uh, the Northwest Coast on a small island just off the coast of British Columbia called Hornby Island. And Hornby Island um, had a massive influx of people in the late 60s and early 70s that were part of the Back to the Land movement that, that ha happened all over Western Canada, where, where young people um, left major urban centers and relocated to rural, uh, rural places. Hornby was one of those. And Hornby was populated by uh, a number of, of communes. People, people that were settling for communal living, or people that were maybe they weren't members of the commune, but they were they were living rurally. And the idea was to create a kind of um, an another space outside of major urban centers. So that was the 1970s. We're too loud. Picks up with, with the son of one of the back to the landers who has a film, who has a band, has uh, a rock band, and uh, he sees rock music as his. Um, as his traditional practice. It's something that his, his, parents, his parents did. His father was a drummer and he's a rock guitarist. And his rock band is part of this, this hippie cultural thing that he's trying to hold on to. Hornby, um, because of its proximity to Vancouver, is being, uh, is being this kind of lifestyle is being threatened by by boomers who are retiring and and buying, uh, there's kind of a land rush going on right now on Hornby because it's a wonderful place, it's a beautiful rural place, and uh, there are houses available. And so in the 70s, the the young people who moved there built houses that that you know they just built houses. They were like two islands away, and they could pretty much do what they want to do. And it was so kind of anarchic that. Even today, Hornby has different building codes than other places, <laughs> be just because it's just like you basically probably wouldn't be able to live in most of the houses that are there just because, you know, the, the way they're constructed, I guess. I don't know what the history of it is. 
Well, what has happened is houses that were built by hand in the 1970s are now being sold for 300, 400, 500, 600 thousand dollars and land that was bought for um a thousand dollars is being sold for a million dollars and the the second generation of people that are uh the, or the next generation or the next generations of people that are living there are are being pushed off the island so this this film documents one kind of process of that um of that process happening we can just by short call it gentrification and it has to do with this rock band from the perspective of, of Bregan Smith, the, the center, central character of the film. It has to do with him being too loud and the rock band is too loud and the retirees want a very rural, safe, comfortable, you know, pastoral place to retire. And Bregan is disturbing that with his, his quote, loud ass rock and roll music. Okay, so that's the, that's the main thing. The main tension of the film is he puts on a community concert and there's a whole bunch of people drinking there and spilling beer on the floor, which they weren't supposed to be doing. And they didn't clean up, they apparently they didn't clean up the community hall well enough. And the yoga class that was there the next morning uh, could smell beer on the floor, as you know, as you would. And Bregan lost all of his gigs for the rest of the summer. Now he 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 has a very marginal existence here and is only is only able to you know you know stay alive by by gardening and doing doing odd work and losing all his gigs um for the for the summer because of not not being able to clean up the hall well enough pose an accident existential threat to his his continuity of life okay so that's the film i screened the film to get back to my point I screened the film at the, the second um, working group for this at the ICTM um, Audiovisual Ethnomusicology uh, Symposium in Lisbon in, I think, 2018. After screening the film, immediately after, the very first question came from a, a German uh, anthropologist who turned to me and said, how is this an ethnographic film? didn't even didn't didn't even give me an opportunity to to engage in any of the any of the stuff just flat out how is this an ethnographic film and i stumbled like i stuttered like i, I had no idea how to how to respond to it it's like of course this is an ethnographic film for all these reasons let me talk all about uh all the post-humanism and i got into this big theoretical kind of conversation about what you know what the film is about because what i thought was interesting about the situation is the 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 the, the struggle about in the entire film has to do with whether or not a mop was broken so like the main character in the film is kind of a mop that we don't see because it's it's it determined whether or not the hall was cleaned properly or not so i thought that was super interesting and humorous and stuff. But the most importantly, of course, it was an ethnographic film. It was just not an ethnographic film in the way that, that, that my colleague was asking. And it's taken me some time to try to understand what it is about that film that doesn't immediately say that this is an ethnographic film. And I think it has to do with this relationship to the demos and the ethnos. Because the film is made in Canada and it's made with, with a group of, of white musicians in the West Coast of the United States, the context of their lives, from the perspective of this ethnomusicologist, the context of, of their lives is, is secondary to the, the, their membership in a particular um, a national group that is is from the perspective of this ethnomusicologist must not be a legitimate starting point. I'm not going to defend their position, uh, obviously, um, because I didn't understand it, but it actually took me some time to recognize that I was put in a defensive position about the film that I had made, not because of the context of the film, but because of the definition of ethnographic film. In time, as you know from the title of this uh, workshop, I no longer call the work that I do ethnographic film. I call it Cine World It because I don't, I no longer believe that, um, well, first, 
ethnographic film is very healthy. There are lots of ethnographic film festivals around the world. There are lots of people writing about ethnographic film. They're going to do what they do, and that's fine. I'm not interested in picking a fight with anybody and critiquing what it is that they do. Instead, to be productive and to try to try to produce other ways of, of thinking and knowing that that don't you know have to that that are not going to mire me in a whole bunch of the disciplinary and definitional uh, issues. I'm going to just say what I do in a positive way, and that's cine worlding. And cine worlding does two things. The cinema part is obvious, cine. And what perhaps is, and it's, you know, while it's obvious that we're using cinema, as we're going to see from this reading, that becomes a really interesting, a really complex thing. Um, the idea of cinema or cine engages, I as began to engage initially with um, um, uh, the concept of um, guest, uh, gestel, which is um, the idea of framing. So when I began to think about it as framing hyphen worlding. Worlding, I take from, from um, a, a variety of people that, that are working in, let's say, the area of process philosophy. Worlding is a process of world making. It's a process of, of body and worlding. And as we're going to see in the, uh, this first reading that we're, that we're going to be, the, the only reading that we're going to be looking at, process is, is super, super important. So there's the enframing and then worlding. And we have what, what we see is the enframing process is a process and the worlding process is a process. And these two processes are working with one another. They're productive and they're productive in really complex ways. Pause the introductory lecture, the, the introductory theory part, because this is where stuff gets really interesting. We are tasked not only with filmmaking, but with writing. And one of the things that, that I want to make explicit from the outset is that while um, there has been a tradition of ethnomusicological filmmakers who have written very little, they, they, they say the film stands for itself. I believe that's absolutely true. The films absolutely stand for themselves. But in my practice, in the cine worlding practice, the, the film is an activator of thought. So it's a process of thinking. The film is a process of thinking. Thinking in the film. And what Deleuze and Guattari say, and this is something that, that I find super inspiring, is that philosophy feeds film and cinema, cinema feeds philosophy. And that in the process of, of doing this kind of process of moving back and forth across research creation, we think about the interrelationship of composition. And it's the interrelationship of composition that I think is so inspiring for me. Because what happens is the process of making film deals with what Deleuze and Qatari call percepts and affects. The process of writing deals with concepts. And I find that as I'm moving across the percepts, affects to concepts, there's something that, that gets richer in me as a practice, right? There's something about my worlding practice that then gets more complex, more entwined, more, um, to use Haraway's idea, more entangled uh, or, or deeper into the mud of the world, as, as she says. The, so what we're going to do as we work through this morning, we're going to move back and forth between thinking about this reading and we're going to take short writing breaks. And the short writing breaks are not assignments. And they're, they're opportunities for you to, to engage with some of the, some of the, the concepts some of the some of the feelings, some of the responses to some of the film clips that we're going to be that we're going to be looking at. How we're going to do that. 
in the process of of teaching th- teaching this workshop um, in person and working with a wide variety of filmmakers from different disciplines, I have find I have found myself getting pushed into um, thinking about or getting pushed into using and introducing so using technology and introducing technology as if technology defines cinema i think we probably agree that a paintbrush does not define painting a camera doesn't define cinema a camera is a tool and as the tool, it, 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 the materiality of the tool allows us to do things unquestionably. But the tool can be used in a variety of ways. And I have found that reducing filmmaking to learning about how a camera works cuts off the process of art making that it's really about. So after a survey of a whole bunch of in instructional books on cinema, I've discovered that for the most part, they have to do with the technology of the technology and the techniques of the, of, of the tools. And for books about how to make film, they mostly talk about fundraising and and kind of big, big issue things like narrative and those sorts of things, because you know, fun, you know, have to fundraise to make films. Because in those films, because they're they are connected to the industry of filmmaking. We're not. I want to I want to get rid of that idea right from the beginning. This workshop is not about making professional filmmakers that are going to be trying to get Netflix deals. This is, you know, we, we have the technology to make films within the academy, within educational institutions, whether they're, you know, junior high schools or high schools or universities or community organizations. We get to make films for our, for our own uses and the uses of our communities. And that's what I want to focus on. All right. So we have these two poles. We have this kind of making art for, for the, uh, um, for commercial circulation, and we have the technology. I think we we need to find somewhere that that that's somewhere in the middle that that uses art making as the beginning, so the creation process, and then emerges like moves out from art making into into technology. And the Deleuze and Guattari article do that for us. Does anybody have any uh, any questions or clarifications at at this moment? You just want to say hi. And I'm also like having done as we've all done lots of Zoom stuff over the last uh, the last year and a half. I'm not going to keep you here for three hours without breaks. Um, I'm I'm going to put you know forced breaks every uh, every you know, hour, um, so we can we can walk around and clear our heads and think about things. I uh, s- s- fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Hi to everybody. Where you, where are you right now, Paul? I'm. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm in Sydney. I'm a CBU colleague of. Uh, Sheila's and uh, Marcia and if anyone else is there from CBU I, I don't know you yet but uh, yeah <laughs> anyway uh, great I've been wait, waiting since May to tune yeah. in on this and um, I'm learning a lot of stuff that I've never heard of before so <laughs> <laughs> great it's Bob. great you great. just keep doing it I'll keep okay. listening thanks friends okay. come to Ashen yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guma. <laughs> uh, I should all, yeah, Marcia, like, uh, I'm also an adjunct professor of music at CBU, uh, newly, which I'm really excited about. And I also should say to everybody that I'm from Cape Breton. Um, oh. I, I grew up in Cape Breton. And uh, I, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, it's true. Grew up in Cape Breton and uh, I was, did my, uh, I did my undergrad at the University College of Cape Breton, actually. 
before uh, before moving on in the world. Great. I'll, we'll talk more some other time about that. We will indeed, Paul. I'll see you back in Cape Breton before long. Great. <laughs> okay, friends. Um, let's move to um, let's move to the reading. Um, percept, affect, and concept. If, if you um, if it's easy for you to pull up the reading, um, you can you can do that. If you just want to take notes, you can do that. Yeah, exactly. If you just want to uh, just listen along, um, that's fine. I'm not going to be obviously. I'm not going to be reading the entire thing, but I am going to read in long form the um, the first paragraph. Uh, the first uh, first two paragraphs because they're they're essential to the to the entire thing. <clears throat> chapter seven. So it's chapter seven from from this book. What is philosophy by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari? Um, so for my information, how many people are familiar with Deleuze and Guattari? Show of hands. A little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. Okay, great, perfect. Okay. Okay, so percept, affect, concept. The young man will smile on the canvas for as long as the canvas lasts. Blood throbs under the skin of this woman's face. The wind shakes a branch. A group of men prepare to leave. In a novel or a film, the young man will stop smiling, but will start to smile again when we turn to this page or that moment. Art preserves. And it is the only thing in the world that is preserved. It preserves and is preserved in itself. Although actually it lasts no longer than its support and materials, stone, canvas, chemical color, pixels, and so on. The young girl maintains the pose that she has had for 5,000 years, a gesture that no longer depends on whoever made it. The air still has the turbulence, the gust of wind, and the light that it had the day that day last year. And it no, no longer depends on whoever was breathing it this morning. If art preserves, it does not do so like industry by adding a substance to make the, the, the thing last. The thing became independent of its model from the start but it is also independent of other possible personae who are the, themselves artist things. Personae of painting, breathing this air of painting. And it's no less independent of the viewer or hearer who only experience it after, if they have the strength for it. What about the creator? It's independent of the creator through the self-positing of the created, which is preserved in itself. What is preserved, the thing or the work of art, is a block of sensations. That is to say, a compound of percepts and affects. And this is what this first workshop is going to be interested in. Blocks of sensation, percepts and affects. And one of the first things that this reading is going to do for us is dis, uh, kind of disamuse us or get rid of the idea that what we record in a camera when we record something is a representation of the thing that was recorded. It is not a copy. When we start thinking of the, the, the film uh, as copy of reality, if we start thinking that what we take um, a digital what we take a digital image of, well, I'm just going to call this film, okay? What well, we film. But when I say film, I don't, obviously I don't mean film, but it can be film. Um, I work in, in super eight millimeter. I work in 16 millimeter. I work in digital high definition video. I work in mini DV. And I also work in, um, you know, with iPhones, but I also work in with a very expensive digital cinema camera. They are all different. I can point them at exactly the same thing at exactly the same time and get completely different things, right? We are not in the, when we record something, we are not making a copy of it. When we think we're making a copy of it, we're falling into a very familiar platonic form of thinking, which then gets us into a question of, as you know, as, as Plato talk, talked about the, you know, we, we end up back in the cave. 
I don't want to get back in the cave talking about whether or not, you know, this is authentic, authentic or real or not real or whatever it is. We're going to focus on the reality of what this is, if you will. And the reality of making art is the percepts and affects, the what Deleuze calls blocks of sensation. And when Deleuze is talking about cinema, and he wrote two books on cinema, um, Cinema 1 and Cinema 2. Cinema 1 was called the movement image. Cinema 2 is called the, the time image. When he's talking about cinema, Deleuze calls it blocks of sensation in time. And it's the blocks of sensation in time that we're going to be we are going we are going to be focusing on so when we're reading blocks of sensation in this because Deleuze and Guattari are talking about all art forms when we're talking about cinema we also have to think about it in time movement in time to carry on percepts are no longer perceptions this is a tough couple of sentences so I we, we want to hang on this for a minute and I should say I've also been hanging out with a bunch of philosophers so I'm 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 really into close reading things so you know at, at the beginning this is slow work but it it will make an enormous difference down the road when we when we start actually dealing with the the, the techniques of making cinema percepts are no longer perceptions they are independent of a state of those who experience them Affects are no longer feelings or affections. They go beyond the strength of those who undergo them. Sensations, perceptions, and affects are beings whose validity lies in themselves and exceeds any lived. And at the very last sentence of this, this paragraph, the work of art is a being of sensation and nothing else. Okay, I read that again. The work of art is a being of sensation and nothing else. It exists in itself. Later on, um, in the next paragraph, they write somewhere in the middle of the paragraph. The only law of creation is that the compound must stand up on its own. And the compound that they're talking about is the blocks of affect and perception sensations. The artist's greatest difficulty is to make it stand up on its own. So one of the things that I want to highlight here is that there has been, I think, an intuition in, in ethnomusicology where ethnomusicological filmmakers who do not want to write about their works, there, I think there's an intuition that the film stands up on its own, as it should, as you know, any, any film should. But there's also been a part in, for, in, in history of anthropological film where this film is meant to be used in the classroom. So it's never meant to stand up on its own. It's meant to illustrate something and then fit into the, uh, fit into the, the curriculum. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when we, when we as we're working through the, the question of decolonization and de, you know, decolonizing the university, I think it's necessary to question all of the things that, that we do and we, we take for granted. One of the things that I think is problematic about the, the, the expository film, the film that's meant to, to merely be a supplement and is not able to stand up on its own, is that it, I think it, A, fundamentally misunderstands what, what the process of cinema is, and I think it gets written over and that, that the, what happens in the classroom, and I'm going to give you an example of this, what happens in the classroom can become contrary to what you think is happening in the classroom. Here's the example. When I began, I was in the middle of my master's degree at Carleton University, and we had a documentary filmmaker come in and show a film. And the, the film had to do with um, had to do with stone carving. Um, and the music in the film was, I don't know if it was composed by somebody or was brought in and added to the film. And at the end of the film, all I wanted to talk about was the musical score for the film. And the documentarian got really frustrated with me and, and, you know, started refusing to answer my questions. And my questions were all revolved around the fact is, you know, 
what in this scene why are we listening to this music like what why am i why are you bringing me to let's let use an example the uh, baroque music why are you bringing me into this kind of baroque space when you're trying to bring me into this well, you're telling me you're trying to bring me into this stone carving space, but you keep bringing me somewhere else. So why are you doing that? And they're like, "What? well, the image is, you know, the stone carver space, that, that's where you are. And I'm like, but I don't understand what, what you're saying because you're bringing me somewhere else. What I discovered in the conversation with the documentary filmmaker is the documentarian was looking at only what was on the screen, was only looking at the image. It was not thinking about the soundtrack, was not thinking about the worlding that was happening. To use a Deleuze and Guattari line, um, they talk about lines of flight. So we're, and we'll see this later. When you're engaging with the percepts and affects, lines of flight emerge and, and we go places. We, you know, these, we follow these beings uh, to, you know, uh, on their own adventures. And what the documentarian didn't get was that in cinema, the, the image, if you will, is audio vision. It's sound and image in a block of sensation. The percepts of sound, the affects and intensities of color and the intensities of sound, they produce what Deleuze and Guattari call refrains. And we're going to see that later in the, in the reading. And those refrains produce territories. And those territories are the percepts, right? That's the, that's what the, that's the kind of thinking that cinema does. And that's why I think it's necessary to start with this idea of blocks of sensation compounds of percepts and affects. I'm going to um, I'm going to give you an example and then we're going to we're going to take a little break. This example is uh, a, a it's the introduction of a film called Elders Room and I'm just going to show you the first um, I'm just gonna show you the first couple of minutes. And it's it's gonna it's gonna end abruptly. Um, yeah, I'm gonna show you three minutes. And at the end of that three minutes, I'm not gonna say anything. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna shut off my I'm gonna shut off my camera. And um, we're gonna come back at um, the 15 mark, whatever hour you're in um, right now, um, the 15 mark or the 45 mark, if anybody is joining us from Newfoundland. Uh, always wanted to say that. Okay, here we go. Especially being, a are you seeing this? Are you seeing this play right now? No, Ma Maybe. no, Michael. We don't have that. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, here we go. Yes. Excuse me, Michael, we don't have any sound. Is it, does it have a sound? It does. Try this. Yes. I want to bring that back to my community to make it. Especially being a young Blackfoot woman, I have a high statistic of going missing or being murdered. And 
you know, I have to live with that statistic my whole entire life. And many of you face that too. And I want to be able to bring that back to my community to make it sure like that, you know, we be who we are and don't have to live with the risk. We don't have to be scared. We can make a change. So what I would uh, what I'd like you to do is seven minutes after the hour. What I'd like you to do is um, is take a little break, and then we're going to come back at um, let's say let's let's come back at twenty five minutes after the hour. So what I would like you to do is a take a little break, and b I want you to write about the blocks of of percepts and affects. I want you to write about the block of sensations. It's just just go for it. All right, and then we're going to come back to it um, at uh, 25 after the hour. And don't worry, I'm not going to be asking you to uh, to share if you don't want to, but it, uh, it, it will give you an opportunity to start writing. And in the process, it will bring up some questions. And then we'll, we'll get to the questions. All right, so 25 minutes after the hour. See you soon.
Cozy. Good. All right, welcome back, everybody. Marcia, I saw your hand up. Did you have a question? You know, I'm trying to wave hi. Oh. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing over there? Good, but my internet really isn't stable enough for me to open because then it gets too glitchy and I miss things that you say or okay. yeah. How is is the audio is the audio from the film clip coming through okay? Yeah, it was perfectly fine. Um, okay. and the seam is hosting, so it it won't mess anyone else up. But in the meantime, to make sure that it's smooth for me, this is what I'm going to do. If that's okay. Oh no, no, of course it is. Great, of course great. It is. thanks. I just see uh, multiple instances of you on the screen. It's, it's, I have a, a number of Marcias, so I wasn't sure. That's you too, yeah. Well, there's actually four Marcias right now. I see. <laughs> I've been sharing my link, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So we're on one page, we're on page 164, and I want to get down to the bottom of 164. Um, where it says it is only the act by which the compound of created sensations is preserved in itself, a monument. 
So for us, that's the, uh, the act of, of making the film. On page 165, however, blocks need pockets of air and emptiness because even the void is sensation. Um, well, the wonderful thing about uh, Deleuze and Guattari's writing is that they, there are um, statements that are, that are aphoristic in the sense that you can, you can, you know, um, put a, put a line, put a line under it or a block around it. You can, you can play with it and, and think about the way that their writing opens up, uh, opens up responses um, for you. On page 166. We paint, sculpt, compose, and write with sensations. This statement is really important for me because one of the things that I want to encourage in our writing is something that's been encouraged in me by, uh, by Aaron Manning. And Aaron's suggestion to me uh, about my writing about my own work, and she, she would also say, writing about your own artistic practice is incredibly difficult work. All right, so there's nothing there's nothing easy about this research creation practice and about um, the 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 writing about your your practice. Is that to to quote this again? We paint, sculpt, compose, and write with sensations. When when we're engaging with the with the writing that we're doing on our films, I want you to think compositionally as well. And what Aaron's suggestion to me. Um, is to look for the tiniest possible moments to, to use as the example that you're going to write about. And from the tiniest possible moments, emerge from those. So use those as the example um, of, of the, or the instigator for your kind of conceptual engagement with the, uh, with, with the work that you've composed in cinema. Don't, um, I sh perhaps I shouldn't say don't, um, I would discourage you from doing simple reproductions of the, of the cinema in text, okay? A description of what happens on the screen is not what happens on the screen. The percepts and affects that we experience, the blocks of sensation that we compose with are far more complex and far more multi-layered than, a, than a, a description of what happens. If it wasn't, you probably wouldn't have made a film in the first place. So when we're, when we're writing about our film work, don't worry about encapsulating the entire film in your writing. Look for things in the film. Look for things in your, your, your filmic thinking. What Deleuze talks about it as what he calls pensée cinéma. The um, sometimes it gets translated as cinema consciousness, but I, you know, I'm not not a big fan. I think cinema thinking is better, and I think it's truer to the French and truer to to what what he's what he's trying to say. When we're working with cinema, when we're working with a camera, we are thinking through the equipment. The machinery of the equipment is not transparent. It, 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 uh, it informs the way we look. For instance, in a very simple way, a cinema camera is only one eye. It, it is, you know, we have, you know, because, you know, um, with two eyes, Bifocal uh, vision provides us with particular depths of field, particular feelings of, of space and distance and locations of things in space. A camera only has one eye. And in the process of that, we use very simple techniques of focus to, to determine what it is that we're paying attention to. We can use, if you're, you're, you have Zoom, um, if, if you have zoom on your camera, you can, you can essentially reach out with that eye to focus on a thing with that. I I've read in a lot of, a lot of, uh, how to make cinema books that, that people equate it with the focusing the way we can focus our attention on something in the room and block everything else out. 
not a big fan of this comparison because it's not the same. And I don't want you to slip between perception and percepts. As Deleuze and Guattari say, percepts and affects are not perception. All right. When we are looking into the world with, you know, with our eyes and we're engaging with the world, um, as, you know, Henri Burks and the, the French philosopher says, we wake up, we open our eyes, we look around and we're surrounded with images in motion. That's where we start. When we pick up the camera, we are, we are making a kind of incursion, a kind of transformation of thinking into the world, into the world of perception. And it's that process that we simply call framing, to frame something um, is, is the process that we're, that we're in, in being engaged, that we're, we're getting engaged in. And as we're gonna see in a little while in this reading, framing has a long history in, in, in art practice. And it has something really important to say about the, the, the way we engage in the world and the way in, when, we, when we frame something in cinema, we're creating kinds of territories. And the, the reason I started with this opening of the, for this particular film is because I'm looking to frame in the non, like in a kind of um, um, a non-signifying way, the feelings of a place. Because I want, I want to, um, at the beginning of this film, I was, I was stumbling with the land acknowledgement. And I'm, you know, I, I work with a fair number of indigenous activists in Alberta and the land acknowledgement currently here amongst indigenous activists is, um, while important, is, it also has to be approached critically in the sense that the land acknowledgement is not, does not get rid of engaging with territory. It should be an encouragement to engage in territory. And what I wanted to do with this, with the opening of this film is to, um, is to through percepts and affects, um, draw out your thinking into a form of land acknowledgement that I think is far more powerful and, and far more, and it's far closer to the idea of the land acknowledgement than the text of the land acknowledgement itself. And then what, what you're going to see, uh, we're gonna, cause we're gonna watch, uh, we're gonna watch that again in a little bit. And you're going to see the way this emerges into the, uh, the, the opening subject of the film. And I wanna talk about that, that traveling, that, that traveling through uh, with through percepts, affects, through the the sound, color, image, um, shots, relationship to one another in the way it produces a territory, because what we're what we're ultimately doing here in the process of making a film is we're producing um, from very small you know very small things. It's smaller than the shot, as I'm going to show you in a little bit. We're, we're, you, we're moving through time, we're entangling time in location, we're entangling sound in where it's sound uh, with image to produce kind of feelings of duration, uh, feelings of time that introduce time itself into the image. We're producing from Deleuze and Guattari's perspective, we are producing time space. And that time space for those of us working in music is incredibly important because in my thinking, time space has within it tempo. And the, the tempo has within it kinds of um, very small um, uh, other, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna see that there's other kinds of tempos within the tempos, that there's, that the image presents us. We can, when we begin to think musically in the film, we begin to engage with, with a kind of audio vision. Um, this is a term that I like to use from, uh, from Michel Chion. Uh, audio vision is a way of seeing the world. And I think um, those of us working in ethnomusicology, um, I think the contribution that we can make to cinema is from music. And I think we can think musically in cinema. And in the process of thinking musically in cinema, we, we can 
uh, I think we can enrich our vocabulary. We can enrich our engagement with the world. And I think we can get, I think we can get into, into domains of, of thinking that Charles Seeger in his 19, in his uh, the introduction to his book in the, in the seventies, he talks about musical time space, but he only talks about it at the introduction and never gets back to it. I think is one of his richest and most kind of uh, most exciting ideas when we're thinking about um, cultural approaches to, to thinking about the world, cultural approaches to worlding, that I think musical time space allows us to get into something that's, that's far um, closer to the idea of culture than, than representative models of writing about culture allow. And I think cinema allows us to do that because it, it, cinema thinks through you. And this is the thing that Deleuze and Guattari are trying to get um, to get us to think about. And Deleuze looks closely at this in his movement image and time image books, where he says the brain is the screen. And what he means by this is that there's this, this, this movement where the cinema works through you. And, and you know, if you've ever seen a horror film or a, you know, a psychological thriller or even a support like what happens to me, I put on what I think is going to be a comedy and it turns out to be a, a dark comedy. And suddenly I could feel this brooding feeling moving up through my body that I didn't feel moments ago. That's the cinema working in me. That's the percepts and affects working in me. And that, that kind of movement and transformation is, is, really, is really complicated and philosophically very rich and provides us with, with really um, fascinating territory to begin to think about um, in, in ethnomusicology. The bottom of 166, a sensation is not realized in the material without the material passing completely into the sensation. And this is, this is exactly what I'm just talking about. I'm gonna read that again. Sensation is not realized in the material without the material passing completely into the sensation into the per percept and affect. So here we're thinking about the materiality of the, for instance, the, the, digital, uh, the digital recording, the transformation of sound uh, into, into you know, binary code, the transformation of light into binary code, and those transformations of all of those, those that, that pixel information and that auditory information in, through our computer processors, out through the screens and out through the through the monitors. A little bit down. Uh, oh, actually, next sentence. All the material becomes expressive. All the material becomes expressive. Now, it's not the prairie that becomes expressive. It's the it's the affect and percept of the pixels and light on the screen mixed with the sound. Um, that, that is expressive in this instance. I am engaging in the, in the prairie with the camera. The prairie is not moving magically through the camera into your eyes. The, you're engaging with the pixelated, you know, you're engaging with the pixels uh, on the screen in the same way that if you were working in film, you would be engaging with the, um, um, with the celluloid, that the materiality of the of the film, the actual film stock, and why I'm harping on this uh, a little bit, and it may feel like um, uh, I'm exaggerating this point, is because when we get to setting our cameras, when we get to the technical details of of camera setup and choosing the cameras that we're going to use, and later in the editing and coloring stages of the of the work that we're doing. We begin, you will see how important this observation is because we begin then to write in color and write in sound comp in, in compositionally so that the color blue, for instance, of the blue sky, the, the green of the grass, the, the, the texture of, the, of the, the wood, all of those things are to a to are informed by the kinds of light that you use and the kind of editing um, and mastering techniques that we'll use later. So when you start going through this, when you start going through this process, you will realize that 
what you, you know, your perception of the space at that particular time of day has to be to a certain extent encoded into your camera when you're setting stuff up so that you can then um, in the editing period um, have access to the color information that you're going to want to have to communicate that to to an audience okay so we're dealing with the materiality of the sensor in your phone the materiality of the sensor in your camera the materiality of the film in the film camera next paragraph 167 by means of the material the aim of art is to wrest the percept from perception of objects and the states of a perceiving subject. So that's, you know, in philosophical language, precisely what I just said. To wrest the affect from affections as the transition from one state to another. This is, this statement is really important in, in my thinking when I'm, when I'm working. I, uh, I take notes. Um, about the the affects that are emerging from me, um, uh, you know, as, as a consequence of my perception of the of the space and my thinking about the project that I'm working on, and I keep those I keep those notes as reference for later, for when I'm trying to think about the coloring, when I'm trying to think about the sound, and what it does for me is it it gives me a starting point, it's like. Where do I want what what you know what do I want the audience to experience at this moment? What kinds of affects and percepts do I do I think is going to engage an audience? And then in my editing, I work to try to re, um, I work to try to um, stimulate that in myself. And in the editing process, which we'll talk about in in next week's uh, work, the editing process is the is the moment where in, in, in important ways, you become the first audience. Um, but as we'll see in the, the third workshop, when we're talking about um, mastering and then screening, third and fourth, you will see that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the sensations that, that are the percepts and affects that, are, that, that, that engage other people are going to engage them differently. And in fact, they're going to, you are going to have a different experience with the film when you watch it with somebody else. And when you sit in, when you, as soon as you watch it with somebody else, you have a different, you have a different set of experiences. Now that observation is philosophically extraordinarily rich. What do you mean I have a completely different response when I'm watching it with somebody else? Like, how is that possible? The thing is the thing and you experienced the thing already. But this is precisely what Deleuze and Guattari are getting at. That it's, it, this is not a thing. This is, it never was a thing and it'll never be a thing. It's a kind of, it's a kind of monument, sure. It's a kind of territory. It's a kind of thing that we built. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a film, but the film is always in motion. And because the film is always in motion, there, there, is con there are constant becomings that, that are occurring. And it's the constant becomings that are, that are the hyphen between research and, and creation. That's what I mean by thinking in the hyphen. It's thinking about the, the movement, the formations, the becoming, the transformations. And um, it's had a really significant um, impact on, on my writing because I, I find now that I'm being moved to write um, um, theoretically about these tiny little moments in my films as opposed to um, um, as opposed to to you know trying to to describe the film in the in the in the film studies you know which is you know traditional in the in the film studies approach and in in that way i'm thinking that my you know my upcoming book that i'm uh, that i'm writing for bloomsbury it's called um it's called cine worlding musicking i think and the the you know one chapter is going to look at one chapter is just going to be precisely kind of talking about this. What is the framing? What is framing? What happens when I look through a camera? Because the first time I picked up a camera and looked through it, I was stimulated. And I was stimulated to engage in the world in a particular way. The camera elicited a form of thinking in me that, that was really exciting and remains really exciting. In the same way, audio recording, um, and when I first started doing it, elicited in me an excitement to go out with a, you know, a microphone and record things. 
Now, Paul's question, would you give us a very quick distinction between percepts and affects? I'm not exactly getting it, but don't spend too much time on this for me. Okay, Paul, this is one of the really exciting kind of difficult things about this. The you know, they, they write about percepts and affects, and then sometimes they talk about affects. And they, they say percepts and affects off, have to be dis, you know, distinguished from perception. Um, but then what percepts and affects are becomes really fuzzy. And there's a, a really good reason for this is because percepts and affects are not concepts. So to, to, to make percepts and affects concepts robs them of the, their percept and affectness. So if you want a starting point, um, percepts, uh, so the, this is kind of it, it reference, it, it's a bit of a reference to um, CS Purse's semiotics. So Deleuze worked with Percy and semiotics. And per said, firstness is something that is only related to itself. And Deleuze uses this as affect. Um, if, so I tend to think about it as bodily intensities. Okay, the, you know, feelings, not quite intuitions, the, the, the it's the, the bubbling up, the bodily forces, and and I don't want to, I don't want this to become too human centric, because it's it's not human centric, right? It's it's the um, um, they would call it the flows of intensities. Um, percepts um, have to do with the. There's a kind of a long conversation that Deleuze has about what he calls the perception image and then moves to talk about percept. Percepts have to do with Peirce's category of secondness, where, the, where something refers to something else. In, in this image, um, I'm going to share screen. In this image, there's a lot that can be talked about in, in terms of percepts here. Like we have to first recognize that this is a collection of pixels. This is not canvas, but this refers to canvas in the same way. Can you see my, um, my, my cursor on the screen when I do this? Okay. In the same way that this refers to wood, right? Now, the affects of this would be woodness and canvasness. This would be the affect of darkness. This is the affect of lightness. This is also the percept of lightness. And we can talk about different kinds of, uh, we will talk later about different kinds of lighting. Like I chose a particular color of light to produce this contrast. Um, and that gets us into, um, I think that's as far as we need to go on that. Is that, is that cool? Yeah, I think I'm getting it. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, if you get it, um, explain it to me because it, you know, this is the, the percepts and affects thing for Deleuze and Guattari is not meant to be an explanation for things. It's meant to be something that stimulates thinking. All right, so we're not going to find, and I've been pouring through, through all kinds of stuff. Um, it's only been recently that I've started to accept the fact that I'm not going to find a definition of percepts and affects from them. Uh, and I think they're avoiding. I think they like. I'm sure they were sitting in the living room one day smoking cigarettes, going like, you know, <laughs> should we find this? And they said, you know, clearly they 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 agree that they should not because. As soon as they do, it stops being percepts and affects and starts being, it moves into what, uh, what, what in purse is called thirdness. And thirdness is something that's related to something into something else. So it's the, for instance, um, if you were to look at, so if we go back to the example of canvas, the 
the that you know the image is related to canvas and canvas is related to tent and so that's the thirdness but then tent is related to collections of tents it's it's connected to you know a particular kind of tent it's in this case would be um you know this is an interesting example because it would be connected to what a lot of settlers would call teepees but what the, the kainai don't call teepees they call lodges um so we have a forking of of um of knowledge systems so thirdness like Deleuze and Guattari say thirdness never well purse says and Deleuze and Guattari repeat that thirdness never stops at three three becomes many um so uh firstness is affect secondness is percept thirdness is we would call that semiotics knowledge you know it opens up into knowledge systems and and knowledge systems for Deleuze and Guattari get nailed down into definitions and it's that kind of representational thinking that um that art doesn't work in necessarily you know that's not the that's not that's not what we do in art we work in percepts and affects you know the you know famous interviews with Dylan in the 60s when you know they say you know what what's this song about and this and he says well you tell me what the song is about I just wrote it that's what he means you know he just wrote it meaning that's for you like I put percepts and affects down into melody form refrain lyric and I give it to you it's you you do what you want with it I'm not going to nail the definition of this thing down into something because it closes off thinking and the closure of thinking is what Deleuze and Guattari are most concerned about. And that's what we have to be careful about when we're, when we're thinking of, when we're, because we're, tr we're trying to cultivate cinema thinking and we're not trying to simplify um, cinema into, into just definitions of, of what it is, right? Because um, Whitehead says, um, he, he, he's, he's, he's always concerned about what he calls simple location. So if I was to, if you were to just to say that this opening sequence, when we watch it, just adds up to this lodge, you, we would be enacting what uh, what Whitehead calls the your know, practice of simple location, which he also calls um, the the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, which is. Um, something that's that's always in my mind about what you know when I'm writing about what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to avoid the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, as if this is the only thing that's happening, right? So it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about um, writing a description of of what's of what's in the film, imagining that that description is what's happening in the film. That's the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Okay, cool. Moving okay. on, they're thinking in movement. Down the bottom of page 167, it is true that every work of art is a monument, but here the monument is not something commemorating a past. It's a block of present sensations that owe their preservation only to themselves and that provide the event with the compound that celebrates it. The term the event is incredibly important in, in Deleuze and Guattari's work. The event is where everything happens. Paul, to give you a, to give you the best definition that they'll give us, turn to page 169 and down the fifth line. The percept is the landscape before man in the absence of man. And he says a little bit, a couple of lines later, this is Cezanne's enigma, which has often been commented upon, quote, man absent from, but entirely within the landscape. Characters can only exist and the author can only create them because they do not perceive, but have passed into the landscape and are themselves part of the compound of sensations. Affects 
This is, this is what they'll give us as a definition. Affects are precisely these non-human becomings of man. Just as percepts, including the town, are non-human landscapes of nature. We are not in the world. We become with the world. We become by, comp uh, by contemplating it. And on page 170, in each case, style is needed. The writer's syntax, the musician's modes and rhythms, the painter's lines and colors to raise lived perceptions to percept and lived affections to affect. Page 173, the affect is not the passage from one lived state to another, but man's or people's non-human becoming. The affect is not the passage from one lived state to another, but a human's non-human becoming. Becoming is an extreme contingu con con contiguity, contiguity within a coupling of two sensations without resemblance, or on the contrary, in the distance of a light that captures both of them in a single reflection. Little, little bit down the page. This is because from the moment that material passes into sensation, art itself lives on these zones of indetermination. They are blocks, spelled B-L-O-C-S. And by blocks, they use blocks now to be the assemblage of percepts, affects, the blocks of sensation. So the, when he's talking about the blocks of sensation from the beginning, it was spelled B-L-O-C-S, not B-L-O-C-K-S, not a block, but blocks, meaning an assemblage, a heterogeneous assemblage of, of forces. Um, I want to um, skip over to the territoriality conversation. But before that, I want to go to page 178. 178, about halfway down, um, starting with the being of sensation. So... So remember, when they say being, they already said art, you know, affects and percepts are beings, right? Art is a being. The being is a monument. So the being of sensation, when they say that, they don't mean the being, you, you know, your experience of sensation, but they're talking about the being of sensation, which is the block, which is already multiple, of percept and affect. <laughs> Charles, it's okay. If anybody has a dog, if you want to know about affects and about how affects move, pay attention to your dog because dogs are like dogs move affect. So the, 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 the way that something, there's a sound, the dog responds to the sound, you respond to the dog, the dog responds to you. That's the kind of, that's the kind of, the, that's the kind of movement that, uh, that Deleuze and Guitar you're talking about. So the being of sensation, the block of percept and affect will appear as the unity or reversibility of feeling and felt. Their intimate intermingling like hands clasps, clasped together. And the hands clasped together is a reference to Merleau-Ponty when he's writing about the flesh and the, what he calls the chiasm. And he, to describe the chiasm, Merleau-Ponty says, when you, okay, do this with me, clasp your hands together in whatever way, and you can feel yourself being felt. You can feel the, you know, you can choose to feel your left hand feeling your right hand or choose to feel your right hand feeling your left hand. This chiasm is the feeling of being felt, the space between the feeling and the feltness, the feelingness and the feltness. 
that there's a small space of indeterminacy, even in our own bodies when we're holding our own hands. And that movement back and forth, the, 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 the experience of the flesh is what Merleau-Ponty kind of focuses on. But then Deleuze and Guattari say, we can go way further than this. This is this is only you know you're this is this is an unnecessary starting place. You're still just feeling your own hands. Let's let's use that idea of that indeterminacy and move it out into the world, and and give that uh, you know give give to the world the autonomy that that it has and stop you know stop stop thinking that we are the center that humans are the center of 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 all things. Um, intermingling like hands clasped together. It is the flesh that at the same time is freed from the lived body, the perceived world. And here we're talking about the flesh of the, the monument that we're talking about. Deleuze and Guattari will, will, as they're writing, they'll, they'll, make the, they'll make these initial ideas like the monument, like blocks of sensation. They'll go back over them and over them and over them like refrains every time giving them giving them further layers of of complexity further um further uh i i like to think of it like the like how a shell is built like uh, the way the way um sea animals will build shells by by secreting layers and layers and layers and layers that's that's the way um to, to answer paul's question this is the way they move through ideas constantly making them more complex, adding more and more layers, showing us that that in, a, in, in very important ways that the concept itself is heterogeneous. So in their writing, conce concepts have, you know, have multiple potentials and they'll, they'll keep working through them. And that this is something that I want us to think about when we are ourselves doing writing about the work that we're doing. I want us to use these, remember at the beginning earlier, I said, um, that you want to find this tiny little moment. And then I want to use that moment and I want to work it. And I want to feel what's going on in that, that idea and, and, and find, you know, connected to other ideas, you know, like the musical time space or the refrain or, or, or in this case, the flesh. Um, the, okay. So in the, it is in the flesh that at the same time is freed from the lived body, the perceived world, and the intention, intentionality of one towards the other that is still too tied to experience. Whereas flesh gives us the being of sensation and bears the original opinion distinct from the judgment of experience, flesh of the world and flesh of the body that are exchanged as correlates, ideal coincidence. A curious fleshism inspired this final avatar of phenomenology and plunges it into the mystery of the incarnation. So this is their break from phenomenology. It is both a pious and sensual notion, a mixture of sensuality and religion without which perhaps flesh could not stand up by itself. The question of whether flesh is adequate to art can be put in this way. Can it support percept and affect? Can it constitute the being of sensation? Or must it not itself be supported and pass into other powers of life? Barrels, it's okay. Flesh is not sensation, although it, it is involved in revealing it. So in, in this moment, they, we, they, they bring us back to our bodies. So first they, they say that the artist moves in to the, the percept and affect the um becomes entwined with the with the work that is that is produced and then they're it they're in in a really important way they're kind of the percept and affect is reaching back out into us and we're beginning to see this movement uh uh through time which we are going to experience when we're making our work we are engaging out into the world we are being engaged by the technology that we're choosing to to point at the world, whether it's an audio recorder or audio visual recording device or a musical instrument or, or painting or work or writing or whatever. And it's, we, we begin to have this kind of movement that produces these multiple layers, these, these multiple, um, these um, layers of, of you know, shell-like deposits that, that begin to form around, around something. 
And the, the forming around something produces what they call a territory. And this gets us to the first phase of, of my Cine worlding practice, which I call territoriality. Territoriality um, is not territory. Okay, territoriality is process oriented. And it's, it's an entanglement in a particular style. And that style, um, they call an assemblage or in French, a gencement. The style, the assemblage is not fixed. So I am not going to give you a method for doing something. I'm going to try to inspire you to engage in the materiality of the technology in a particular way, so as to set you on a journey that you will develop your own style. Okay, so it's not about I, you know, I am not a proponent of saying cine ethnomusicology is this, and that cine ethnomusicology should look like this, because. As if we are getting back, let's bring us back to the beginning. If we are talking about decolonizing ethnomusicology, that means we are about, we are proponents of diversity. Methodology and method and diversity are contrary. If we say this is what needs to happen, and this is the way it is, and this is what it looks like, this is our method, and this is what this method produces we're not going to get where we want to go. We're not going to get to the place that we, we, we you know, that, that our, our initial ethics inspire. So cine worlding is not a method. Uh, I, you know, is it a methodology? I don't really care. It's a practice. This is a research creation practice. And just leave it at that. Let's just say it's a research creation practice. Page 184. This emergence of pure sensory qualities is already art. Not only is the treatment of external materials, but in the body's posture and colors, in the songs and cries that mark out a territory. A little bit further down. This is not synesthesia in the flesh, but blocks of sensations in the territory blocks of sensations in the territory. And remember in cinema, they would always say blocks of sensations in time in the territory. Colors, postures, and sounds that sketch out a total work of art. These sonorous blocks are refrains. Territoriality, this first block of cine worlding, is about refrains. Aaron Manning gave me a really interesting way of thinking about this, this, first, this first part of the process. She, she, said, she said, it's really like you're kind of engaging in a dramaturgy of existence. And I really like that, the dramaturgy of existence. The idea that we are, we are moving out into the world as it is and we're seeing, we're seeing art, we're seeing, we're seeing the, the dramatic in perhaps the, the mundane. We're seeing the dramatic in, the, in this instance, in the field, in the relationship between the, the sky and the earth and the fence and the, and the, and the fur and the tobacco and the, and the pipe and the stone um, and the sage and the fur. And we're seeing, we're seeing the dramatic between those things and we're, we're producing a territory we're territorializing the the uh, in the, the 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 territory of the the Kainai Nation, which is what this where this film is located, the sound of Kainai traditional music, and we're bringing this territory these this territory created through these blocks of sensations, these percepts and affects, and we're locating them in a very specific place, and we're that we're then it's then then this is opening. This is already kind of, we'll begin to territorialize the first, the, you know, the bodies that we begin to see so that these bodies are located in this, in this, 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 this space. And that's the territoriality. On page 185, every territory, every habitat, 
joins up not only its spatio-temporal, but its qualitative planes or sections. A posture and a song, for example, a song and a color, percepts and affects. And every territory encompasses or cuts across the territories of other species or intercepts the trajectories of animals without territories, forming interspecies junction points. A little bit further down the page. Oh, no, actually, I'm going to read the, the rest of this page because it's really important. It is in this sense that, uh, to start with Yuxil, develops, uh, to start with, develops a melodic, polyphonic, and contrapuntal conception of nature. Not only does birdsong have its own relationship of counterpoint, but it can find these relationships in the songs of other species, and it may even imitate these other songs as if it were a question of occupying a maximum of frequencies. The spider's web contains a very subtle portrait of the fly, which serves as its counterpoint. On the death of a mollusk, the shell that serves as its house becomes the counterpoint of the hermit crab that turns it into its own habitat, thanks to its tail, which is not the swimming, but is prehensile, enabling it to capture the empty shell. The tick is organically constructed in such a way that it finds its counterpoint in any mammal, whatever that passes below its branch as oak leaves arranged in the form of tiles find their counterpoint in the raindrops that stream over them. This is not a teleological conception, but a melodic one in which we no longer know what is art and what is nature. What they, what they call in brackets, natural technique. There is a counterpoint whenever a melody arises as a mo motive when, with, within another melody, as in the marriage of the bumblebee and the snapdragon. These relationships of counterpoint join planes together, form compounds of sensations and blocks, and determine becomings. Now, this is, this is ultimately what we're getting at with percepts and affects. The point of territoriality is not to represent a territory. The point of territoriality is to produce becomings of different kinds. That's the becomings that are, that are made possible with the percepts and affects. It's the becomings that are made possible within you uh, in, through, as you move through the process of territoriality. It's the, it's the becomings of your students. It's the becomings of community members. It's the becomings of the, the friends that you're making the, the you, you're doing the film work with. It's the becomings that for Deleuze and Guattari are the, the core of the ethics of the practice of, for them, philosophy. And, and for them, I would say their definition of real art is, the, is, is art is about becomings. It's about mobilizing percepts and affects into refrains. Um, those refrains move through time. And those entanglements with those, those intensities produce within you, the maker, um, and viewers, whether, whether or not it's, you know, at this moment or in two years or five years or 10 years or never, that it produces it, uh, you know, it produces new kinds of becomings and the kinds of becomings where multiple fields, you know, multiple films, I've had people talk about, you know, uh, some of my films, um, connected in ways that I've never considered, um, producing new becomings between the films. I, you know, it's not about me. It's not about you. The films have their own relationships. They do their own work. They, they, they you know, they have their own, they, they are beings and as beings, they live their own lives. And, um, and that begins our, our move into the materiality of the, of the work. We're gonna, I'm gonna, we're we're gonna come back to page 187, and we're gonna talk about materiality. And when we talk about materiality, we're gonna be talking specifically about the materiality of the camera, and our engagement with the camera in the world. So this is where the techniques come from, the the, the techniques of using the the camera equipment for the production of percepts and affects. But first, now that we've now that we have the idea of the refrain. What I want to do is I want to show you the clip that we that I showed you the first part of, 
And we use that as an example. Now I want you to, to now you know, knowing what you know about what we were talking about, I want you to watch into the beginning of this film. And I want you to, to think about percepts, affects. I want you to think about the, the, the sensations, the blocks of sensations. I want you to think about the, the emergence of time within the, within the image, the felt time. Because that's something for Deleuze and Guattari that's really important about cinema and that connects cinema and thinking um, directly is that it's moving in time. Uh, and that for them, it allows them, they move from philosophy into cinema in the, in, in, to, to uh, enrich philosophy. We're moving from cinema into ethnomusicology and back to enrich ethnomusicology or enrich whatever discipline that you're, you're, you're starting from. The idea is cinema can enrich our thinking because it is a form of thinking. And once we begin to think about thinking as percepts and affects, as these intensities that move through time, where we open ourselves into new territories that, that, that then invite us to do new conceptual work to come up with, with new concepts. The refrain is one of their concepts. So what I want you to do is think about the refrain. I want you to think about this, the territoriality that, that is, uh, that is in forming this work. And then I'm going to stop it. Um, after, uh, you know, we're going to watch about five minutes of it and that'll bring us to about 1225. And then we're going to, uh, we're going to take a short break.
without compassion, you can't be sympathetic to her ways. That's the thing that people realize or don't realize. It is your body language. And to say something inappropriately or say something in a defensive way, we're going to react to it. But if, what if you say something positive? Then you're going to get the positive mm -hmm. reaction. Mm -hmm. But because you can do that easily as a dominant society to control that. So we end up being a bad person. When you talk about the creator, when you were at the school, would they let you speak about the creator in the way you learned it? Uh, they didn't really, there was no translation yet. As a young age, uh, it was later on as I got older, when I started to hear like my dad and my mother pray, but I never really asked them, well, who's this person? Hey? Uh, my mother spoke English, so just say it's God. Hey? So, but later on, as I started to understand the English part, I started to make the connection. Well, God is the same thing as the creator of life and the source of life. Uh, so these are the same thing as the, the creator or God himself. So that's what they didn't really explain because we didn't really question that as young. I didn't question it. All I knew there was something very important. Then later on, as I became an adolescent, as a young man, they started to tell us this way of our people of the past, of what we practice connecting ourselves back to the spiritual, was our sacred way of life. So if that sacred way of life that helped our people of the past is what we're reconnecting ourselves to. But to reconnect yourselves to it, the older generation from 60 on up to 100, she got to heal. All right, so it's 1223. So let's take, um, let's take a, a seven minute break and, and come back at uh, 1230 for the last half hour.
Hello, friends. <clears throat> On page 188. From page 188 and 189. Uh, so I would say from page 188 to pretty much the end um, in different ways. There's there's two there's there's two things that are put in relationship to each other. What they call a plane of composition and the plane of materials. And the plane of composition, uh, so the plane of material works with the plane of composition. And they talk about the way the plane of materials frame and deframe and work with the plane of composition. The what I, I want to think of these two frames in a these two planes in a dynamic relationship, the, the planes of materials and the planes of composition. So if you pick up your phone and um, if you if you downloaded the uh, if you downloaded the app, just with a show of hands, did anybody download the uh, the, the app Filmic Pro? Anyone? Anyone? No. Yes, you did. Cool. Cool. Other Marcia. Okay. Cool. So let's let's uh, let's pretend. I'm going to. I'm going to. In a second, I'm going to um, talk about Filmic Pro. In the meantime, because what Filmic Pro does is your phone. Yeah, yeah. There it is. In your in the 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 camera in your phone is actually incredibly, um, it's actually incredibly good. And there, there's a lot of capacity, there's a lot of potential sitting inside the phone. So the, uh, what, what, this is a really good example of the plane of material. Um, if you open your camera app, just your basic camera app on your phone, and uh, you, so you, you, you have a couple of options, so mostly you just, you know, if you take it, and you just point at something. Um, if you point at the, you point it at the screen, you know, we are all going to be in focus. And then you point it at the, um, something further away from you. Keeping an eye on your screen the entire time. You'll see that the, you'll see that the, uh, the focus shifts on its own. So if you point at something near to you, focus will be focus will be tight and it will be if you point it at something like really near to you like the edge of your screen so that you can see also behind the screen you'll see that the edge of your screen is in focus and the stuff behind your screen is out of focus and that's going to happen automatically so what this what what the camera does is the plane of material in this case focuses your attention so the plane of material, because of autofocus, the plane of material creates the plane of composition. You have no say in it. You can try to you can try to fool with it a little bit. You can you know move away from the. So I'm just gonna do this so you can see my phone. You can do this and then move it quickly away from from looking at something close and you'll 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 see the time it takes to go from focusing on the thing that's close to the focusing on the thing that's far that time of shifting focus you will notice that your attention follows that shift of focus and that when it the focus settles on something you are beginning to contemplate the thing that it's focused on when you point your whatever you point your camera at Currently, I'm focusing on Bruce. As soon as, as soon as I'm focusing at Bruce, my attention is on Bruce. And there's a whole bunch of stuff happening around me, but the, 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 the materiality of the phone is focusing my attention on Bruce. That's moving from the plane of materiality to the plane of composition. And I am forming a, a territory of Bruce. And then a, a whole bunch of what we're talking about is emerging from that. The first assignment. Uh, for you 
and these assignments are not for me, they're just for you. My, my first assignment is to take your phone and play with that. Uh, take it, I want you to, for the next week, I just want you to, to, to begin to think compositionally. I just want you to take your phone out. If you haven't made a film before, just take it out and film stuff. Just give me one second, my dog is barking. The mailman visited. That was uh, that was not a good thing. The you okay? Okay. Okay. So if you download Filmic Pro or what Filmic Pro does is it gives you it gives you control over the um, plane of composition. And what it does, it gives you it gives you focus control. Um, let's see. So it gives you focus control, it gives you zoom control, it gives you uh, an ability to to set the set color. Um, it uh, you can see your your audio meters and in the process of playing with these things, you will begin to to have your first experiments with the plane of composition. The plane of materiality is not, of course, just the phone. The plane of materiality is also the 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 because you you know your camera is always in relationship to the to to what it is that you're filming. So what I want you to what I want you to I want you to film uh, you know anything whether it's trees moving or you know you know children or friends or family or you know or you know still life still life stuff like a bowl of fruit or whatever 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 it is you know some of you playing music whatever it is that you're into um just film a bunch of things now the filming a bunch of things is only the first part of the assignment the second part of the assignment is going back and watching the stuff that you filmed a little bit later and what i want you to think about is the difference between filming it and watching it again and I want you to pay, and I want you to write about it. I want you to write about the difference. The Liz and Guitari are constantly into dis, you know, exploring differences. I want you to write about the difference that emerges between um, filming it and watching it again. And then I want you to give it another day or two, and I want you to watch it again. And then I want you to, to and this is not in any particular order, but I want you to write about the difference between watching it and watching it again. And then I want you to film more things after you've done this process. And I want you to pay attention to how your plane of composition is transformed. And I want you to think about the things that you learn about the, the camera as you play with it. And this process that's a very good question, Sheila. I don't know if it's, if it's available on Android, but any um, um, any kind of uh, app that that is designed to make cinema that's you know you don't you don't have to spend very much money. I think I think this um, I think Filmic Pro is like fifteen dollars or something. You know, it's anything that will will give you some control over your camera. Uh, <clears throat> and then when you're so the the oh it's coming up as 20 bucks okay when we did a look the other day it was uh, i thought i thought we thought it was 16 but okay 20. um the um what we're interested in is that these differences and the real reason we're interested in these differences is because in the process of you thinking about the differences you are thinking and this is this is the, the thing that's pedagogically, I think, the most interesting about the, this first introduction into into filming after we've already thought about percepts and affects and time and refrains. We then begin to we we begin we begin. Oh, great, Marcia just gave us the uh, the filmic pro, so it is available. 
in the Android version. Great. This process of thinking is precisely what we're interested in. Territoriality is the process of thinking through the materiality uh, into the plane of composition. So take some time and read through that last part of the, the chapter about the relationships between the plane of composition and the plane of the sorry the plane of material and the plane of composition, because <clears throat> and pay attention to the refrains that are that are that begin to emerge for you, and because those refrains, those refrains are what I mean by territoriality. It's these ref the the and and those refrains are going to be different from from me. They're going to be different from each other. This is going to be the development of what uh, of what they call as Jean Simon, uh, which is essentially your style. All right. We have um, sixteen minutes left. I've talked enough. Thoughts, questions? Yes. Marcia says, for all of those who are using the link shared by the one and only Marcia, thank you for persisting through whatever technological challenges we have faced. Great, and there's, we have a registration link. I, I don't know. I kind of like a whole bunch of this being Marcia. It's uh... yeah, I'm with you. I think it's really cool too. Um, but I'm just thinking that for the sake of communication, it might be helpful if you knew who you were actually talking to, and then we could also thank, say, Tosho in this instance for his role in helping us. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Michael Paul here. Hey, that, Paul. that's that. That app should download to like an Apple iPad, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. Great. Hi. Uh, I've got a question here. Like, uh, I'm a musician, and I have essentially sort of anti-intellectual approach to music. Yeah. I consider it a craft, you know. Yeah. And. and uh, and, only, and although I've like written a bunch of papers, I'm about to start my dissertation, which may, you know, may include some video material. I'm, uh, I don't think in these kinds of terms and, and, and there'll be a bunch of spiritual stuff in my, in my paper because I'm sort of infused with Eastern thinking. Mm -hmm. so, so I find the whole thing a little bit confusing, uh, you know, because of that. So. And uh, furthermore, when I when I'm uh, I'm ended up uh, all, uh, interesting, though I'm not really a, a, an ethnographic person at all, like I'm just like sort of totally musically focused. I'm going to end up doing uh, an, an auto ethnographic paper, and uh, and and I still at, up to this point I haven't managed to use any of the terms. Like I don't like the term musicking. For example, is other words. I don't like the coining of new words or the, or excessive use of like multi-syllabic, uh, you know, terms. You know, so so um, so you can see I'm a little bit of a of a corny about how to process this stuff. You know, it, some of it just like I just glaze over a little bit. Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, much like you, uh, much like you, Bruce. Right. Yeah. Um, Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'm also a self-taught musician. I didn't, uh, um, I didn't go to music school until my PhD, and I've had uh, precisely the same uh, struggle um, with with entering into the into the university language. Probably mm -hmm. precisely because <clears throat> um, I think I probably shared a little bit of the um, anti-intellectualism that, that that you feel. One of the things that I like about Deleuze Guattari's work is that they, they um, while they do use big words sometimes, they, they only use the words to, to try to get to the 
experiences that we have and the techniques that we use. And they, the reason that they use odd words is because they don't want them to get them confused with other things. Like, you know, you know, Christopher Small, when he wrote musicking meant a lot more than music making. No. And, and, you know, but it's gotten reduced to music making because it's too similar a word. <laughs> so do Lewis and Guattari make up these really, you know, you kind of unique uh, words in order to not be confused or, you know, to not, you, you know, to not be confused with what they're talking about. It's the words aren't important. The words are, you know, as, as you'll, you know, as you'll discover when you're writing your dissertation, as soon as we engage in, into the, you know, the, the process of composing our ideas in language or more precisely for you, for us, Percepts and affects are what you work in as a musician. We just don't we don't we don't name them. We we feel them. We use the technology. What do you play no, guitar, Bruce? Uh, trumpet, and I'm, I'm composing. Okay, great. Um, so, for instance, my I, I made a film um, um, with Peter Tony, um, a composer based in the Halifax of. Uh, 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 about a choral work that that he he's he wrote <clears throat> and the choral work emerged at, at the same time as he is um beginning his 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 journey into orthodox orthodoxy so he takes these these he takes these these four notes and then and then processes them through this 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 feeling that that is really like spiritual and and deeply it's deeply about his his bodily connections his bodily feelings about the truthfulness of of uh, of his conversion to orthodoxy he doesn't need to use any of those words because he he's he's writing it he's he's using the odd the 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 that he's making these territories of sound in the choral work and then doing it in in the film what i try to do is i try to follow i try to follow that 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 i start in a very spiritual um in a spiritual way and then like it's interesting the way that spirituality turns into when it moves from him onto the paper and then moves to the com the conductor and the choir and the musicians it becomes very technical right very specific it because you know when as a composer you're transforming these affects into 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 notes and then those notes have to be interpreted by somebody else what the and guitari are encouraging us to do is take that process seriously and take the process of the the affects that the 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 you know the the what the world that you are engaging in bruce when you transform that from your experience, from your perceptions of the world through your imagination and through your technique of a composer down to the notes. That process of putting it down to the notes is a, is a territorial process. You are producing, you're producing a, a, a territory that then somebody else is going to deterritorialize. The, the, every player brings these same things, their traditions, their histories, the, the, uh, you know their practice their their instrumental you know pedagogy all of this they're bringing it all together and they're taking your notes and they're deterritorializing your notes and they're re-territorializing your notes in themselves and then the person they sit beside and the section and then their section related to the other section their territories that are being re-territorialized and territorialized and then it's it's building these you know, houses inside houses inside houses that are becoming this this other thing, right? Um, the language at the beginning um, is an obstacle. I totally get it. But I, what I would like to encourage you, because these philosophers for me, as a player to a scholar and back as a, you know, a filmic artist, for me, this is the closest language to to my experience of 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 making art so um i have found that in the process i have been able to um by doing the hard work of understanding the 
the technique, their techniques of writing in the same way that, you know, we would, uh, as compo like as composers or people working in composition, we spend the work working out the technical details of our, our compositional practice. This is another compositional practice that I would like you to encourage you to think about in relation to one another. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying, they are not writing over art. They're trying to use art as a starting place for their thinking. And even if you don't use their language, perhaps you could follow their, their process. You could use your process of, of art making uh, and you could produce your own vocabulary um, and make your own words. And, and, in the pro and in fact, that's precisely what I'm encouraging you to do with these writing exercises. The idea is for us to produce our own theoretical language. And, and it's not to be mystifying, but it's to, to actually take seriously the artistic production that we're engaged in and to learn more about what it means to make, what it means to ultimately to, to, to be an artist, what it means to, to, um, to engage in the world this way and to take seriously what we're trying to contribute to the world. And the only reason you have to do this is because you're gonna write a dissertation. Like, Musicians don't have to do this, mm -hmm. um, but it's the process of taking on the the uh, the extra duty, I guess, of writing the dissertation that that is pushing you into a new plane of composition. Now, I think the question is going to be with your relationship to your supervisor: Is that plane of composition going to be imported into your work from other things, where you're going to be encouraged to use terms? that other people have invented so you can describe it for yourself or are you going to uh are you going to be able to find your language um relative to other people's language to produce something that that makes yourself uh understandable you know to other people yeah there's no uh, uh there's no bridle on me at all particularly you know that so far i'm just encouraged to do whatever i want you know I gotta right rich experience and it's quite a unique sort of unique so that's why i was in, sort of encouraged to do this right so and and i the thing that attracts me about music it always has is that it's a way to to some it's an act of creation yeah that's all like and i i celebrate that and and i worked a lot with in uh in africa i worked with and with african musicians and and that even solidified more of this kind of this sort of like sort of elemental way of like looking at things, just like real simple response uh, and uh, nonverbal. Yeah, you know that the all all our talk about music is just talk about music. It's not music, and in and to some sense, I think it can't really be explained. It's some is somehow no matter how far we get into it. We dumb it down somehow. We don't. We don't. We're not feeling it. You know. We're, yep. Yeah. Um, we're we're not feeling it because writing is not about feeling. Writing is about concepts. Yeah, and I don't have any trouble with writing. I mean, I really yeah. dig it. You know. No, I'm no, sure. too. Yeah. But, yeah. So uh, anyway, and I'd like to ask other sort of technical question because it ha I, I I'm coming at it from this point of view. I'm going to in in my. Somebody, one of my supervisors suggested that I do a sort of video, uh, video component, and I started thinking about it. So, and ordinary, I've done a few videos that have mostly been about not shot with a camera, but just trying to, but just scanning music and then adding images on top of it, you know. So it's like it only would make sense to a musician, perhaps, and and not really talk to, you know, it's not for being no trees. You know, and I don't have any video material of myself, you know, as a kid in Fredericton in the yeah. 1950s, you know, like, yeah. uh, I mean, that, that stuff doesn't, uh, that, that doesn't exist. So I'm going to have to make up stuff if I do this. So I'm a little bit intrigued about the process, but I don't expect to get a camera out. And I could, I mean, I might go and do this and me, it'd be a cool, uh, you know, cool thing to do. You know? Yeah. But well, uh I've got another technical thing. I'll be using ScreenFlow probably or something else just to grab images and try to 
make collage or something and maybe write some music behind it you know yeah sure do you do do you have do you have a, a camera on your phone oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. just yeah. just use that i would I, like when i would encourage you to think about like if you're going to talk about you know you 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 mentioned fredericton growing up in fredericton in the 50s yeah. put yourself there go back there and don't worry about visually what what fredericton in the 1950s looked like but construct in your begin to compose in your mind images mm -hmm. feelings and images no, just feelings Com think of the feel think of what it felt like to be in your living room in Fredericton in the 1950s and figure out that feeling and then make that feeling visually take your phone and go find things that that elicit in you that feeling whether it's colors textures objects whatever do that don't worry about narrative. That's cool. It breaks Don't me out. But abstract. Yeah, man. Just just grab it and do it. Just move <laughs> from the move yeah. from the affix into the world, and then use your camera to to make you know find things that make that that make that feeling um, real for you, and then put that on screen. That's the that's the thinking. Right. That's the thinking that Deleuze and Guitar are asking us to do. Find those find those refrains that that connect to those territories, because that living room in the 1950s. Um, you know, I think about this a lot in my work, actually. I'm like, you know, growing up in Glace Bay in Cape Breton in this on this street, I have this image in my mind of from the front yard of my street. And I constantly think about the world that was in my head as a seven-year-old in a small town. That was my world, right? And I knew every street and I knew every stick and I knew every spot and I knew all, you know, all this stuff. And I can draw all of that out from me in a, in a moment. And, a, and, a, and it draws all of these feelings with it, right? What I wanna do in cinema is precisely that. I just wanna be able to then communicate that to somebody else in the same way that like playing, a, you know, playing an instrument I want to I want to make something that's going to draw that out. So get to that place and then compositionally, you know, do that work and then write about the process. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, that's actually fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is, of course, it's it, it may not mean anything to anybody else, or they may, may have a totally different notion about it. You know? It will mean something completely different to somebody yeah. else. And that's that's what makes this such a complex, fascinating thing. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, that's that's what communication is. Like that's what that's what our sharing is. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really it's fascinating. And it just keeps moving. It's like thoughts are always in motion. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. That was great. Yeah. We have a couple of questions in the chat, uh, Michael. From Marcia, start uh, from Marcia mentioned two points, uh, which was the question of most of the audience here. What, what where are the questions from Marcia? Uh, to, uh, at minute twelve forty six. So she's. Oh yeah. Hi. Um, could we ask you to offer and seem some notes that she could circulate to all registrants after today's session and we will post it on our website links to the possible on phone. Yeah, well, sure, I guess. I mean, we can uh, follow up with that afterward, Michael, if that's yeah. something that maybe an sure. can help you with that sure. we can um, just tend to kind of keep the conversation going on outside the class, but also some pro provide some support, right? Whether yeah. whether Nassim can kind of like pick your brain and get some help with that. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And sure. I also just wanted to say thanks to Bruce and Michael for that discussion. I, I, I've often, I mean, I come to this, you know, we come to this together and I certainly feel that too, like having grown up in an isolated farm in Northern Alberta, like how do I, how do I share that feeling? And I want to share it through these, you know, images or ideas or, or the senses of place that we, that I try often to create with film and photography. I mean, obviously as an, eth as an ethnomusicologist myself and as a singer and a dancer and uh, everything else that, that I do. Right. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I think that's really important, Marcia, for like to 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 bring us back to the very beginning of the conversation about decolonizing the practice. 
Bruce, what you're asking is precisely what the point of all of this is. I mean, for way too long, academics and scholars have talked over um, the creative practice. And I think one of the, th one of the things that, um, one of the things that I think we're, tr perhaps some of us are trying to do is take that creative practice very, very seriously for what it is. And I was, I was kind of, I was reminded of something, but you said um, when you were working with the African musicians that, um, you know, there was, a, there was, you know, you had, you were making music, it was simple, you were making music. And it's like, I want you to underline the word simple in that sentence, because we all know how, how kind of deep and transformative that thing that we call simple is, right? And if once we begin to take the transformative capacity of the things that that are considered simple, then we begin to push back at, at uh, all of the forces that have pushed out the the um, the, the transformative um, process of making art um, and push it to the sides for the name of for the names of technique or or or, or you know you, you know theory, but in the at the same time the act of doing this as a scholar means pushing back in a creative way so that we're encouraging people to, we're encouraging our, our fellow scholars and our students and our communities to think more deeply about the things that, 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 that music does for us, that, that art does, you know, does for us. Okay, there's a statement. The difference between optic and haptic images can give some clue to all of this interesting affect uh, whirling image sound. Yeah, precise. As long as the optic and the haptic are are constantly transform uh, transforming each other and in relationship with each other. Yeah, yeah. When they become poles, they do the opposite. So when the optic and haptic are separated, as as often the case, uh, when they're put on a continuum, um, so that they're not intermerged. Um, so we have to make sure that when we're thinking about that, we're, we're thinking through them as if they're folded onto one another instead of, instead of uh, in relation like that, which is why, um, uh, which is why Deleuze and Guattari avoid using um, that, that terminology, um, even though it was widely available at the time when, when they were writing. They're not writing into, they're not writing, um, as is the case with their practice, they don't like to negate anybody. So they don't, they, they intentionally don't like critique anybody, which with the consequence is they, they sometimes they don't engage in a conventional discourse and they make up their own words. Um, so as to just add something to a conversation. And this is one of those interesting examples where they're, they're talking about the most plane of materiality and the plane of composition already within um, this, um, um, this percepts affects in relation to perception kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, I dig that. Yeah, awesome. I think that's a great note on which we can wrap if that works for you. Sounds good. Anybody have any final questions? Because we started at seven minutes after, so I have two more minutes, Marcia. This is your time. <laughs> yes. Uh, just a quick, just a quick question. Um, I I don't plan to use my phone to do the um, filming. I, I plan to use a camera. Is it okay Great. to just use my camera, or do I still need to download the app? No, oh, no, 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 no. Use your camera. No, the the idea was just uh, you know when we were originally putting this together, there was um, it, it didn't want to be exclusive to to people. Okay of working with the camera. And if uh, you already know how to use the camera and have it, fantastic. Um, this, this first process is just, you know, exploratory. Um, in, the next, in the next process, while we're going to be talking about editing primarily, um, the first thing that we're going to do in the context of editing is begin to look back at some of the, uh, some of the settings on the, on the cameras. So we're, I'm not expecting anybody to have final footage at this point. It's just begin to explain, play and experiment. And then we're going to learn out what some of the other things are like, um, you know, like um, 
you know, focus, focus stuff, you know, planes of focus and depth of field and aperture and, and lighting and Kelvin temperatures and all of those technical things we'll talk about at the beginning of next time. Okay, thanks. Cool. Okay, that brings us to seven minutes after Marcia. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Michael. For your really attention. Appreciate this. And to everyone who's been with us today, I see Maisie down on my screen too, um, not far from where I'm sitting today. So that's really nice uh, to see some new faces and also especially Michael to you and to Nassim for support. <laughs> and Soledad, how wonderful to be connected with you uh, from Argentina. So, so I hope we'll see you again um next monday same time same place michael good to go good to go thank you everybody and thanks for the uh thanks for the the, the statement sold that that was uh, that was really great i look forward to your engagement next week thank you I, I will sorry can i say something very quick of course um, i think all these like um approaches to our feelings and uh, my work, I'm anthropologist, so I'm always interested in interculturality, uh -huh. you know, so I think this is a way to approach, approach, not get to, but approach not interculturality, you know, for me, that's, that's the challenge. Yeah, and that, and that's the, that's the core of, of, of the practice, the, I'd like, once we begin to think about refrains and we be begin to think to we begin to emerge uh, or approach other kinds of territorialities, other kinds of of um, of of refrains, whether it's in you know, tempo or, you know, all sorts of different ways, we begin to, um, you know, we have the experience, the anthropological experience of, of moving through these uh, these relationships. And within once ourselves, sorry, and within yeah. ourselves, too. Yeah, precisely like in Bruce our was, was saying, no, like, how, yeah. I, I, how can I, I approach myself, my feelings, my affects, my person? Yeah. yeah, because we are approaching the world in, we're approaching the world through ourselves. Like we're, we're getting past the, the, you know, the me other scenario and we're, we're, you know, we're, we're finding relations We're we're beginning to work relationally. Um, yeah, I'm glad you said that because yeah, that's what I find most exciting about this and most transformative. Dig it. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Everyone, thanks Michael and Marcia for today. Thank you. Have a nice one. Yeah, thank you.